Hey guys, this is Nilan from the BCIS and this is yet another uh, webcast episode that we bring you. We apologize about the fact that we have not brought you any interviews for a while but uh, hopefully this will save your, your hunger for a, good, for a good interview. I have a very special guest today, Mr. Praveen Abhiratna. In terms of the actual impact that warfare has on the environment, what is your assessment? So, I can look at it in, in two different, uh, for two different angles. One is uh, direct impacts and indirect impacts. So in, in terms of direct impacts, you can look at it as um, examples would be like the explosive remnants of war or using the environment, as I mentioned before, as a tactics or targeted environmental destruction. So indirect impact, you could look at it as um, things like refugees or insecurity, lack of governance uh, or a war resource uh, extraction of natural resources for the war economy. So, in terms of uh, direct impacts, if you go back in history, as far as uh, the Mesopotamian states warfare, they would actually uh, break dikes uh, to flood agricultural uh, land. So, the scorched earth policy, I think uh, most people have heard of that before, where it was mostly about targeting agricultural lands. But this has been done by the Romans, it's been done, as I mentioned, the Mesopotamians, uh, even uh, during World War II. The Germans, when they were withdrawing from uh, Russia, they uh, destroyed something like 28,000 villages in uh, the Ukraine. Uh, they destroyed dams. Um, and then also the British in Malaya. Uh, they would destroy the agricultural plants. But in terms of targeted uh, effects, I think the most Horrific and well-known example is uh, the, the U.S. in Vietnam. So that's where the term uh, ecocide came up. So I think they used something like 79 milli uh, million liters of herbicides um, on um, a defoliant. So Agent Orange was a defoliant on most of uh, South Vietnam's jungle. So that was to to deny uh, both deny. Uh, the, the Viet Cong, uh, their uh, transport routes for their uh, supplies, as well as uh, hideouts and to avoid attacks. So you also have clearing of jungles. Uh, I, I, anyone who went, has been to the A9 during wartime or, or right after would see uh, a large section of the jungle being cleared. So visibility uh, from many, even in Central African Republic, that's something that happened. They, they just clear cut through forests so that they would have uh, parts where security would be guaranteed uh, to pass through. Interestingly, in Sri Lanka, in the, uh, during the JVP insurgency, Kanalia uh, forest in the south of Sri Lanka, that was actually being logged. And uh, the JVP came in and torched all the equipment and got rid of the logging, logging companies so that they could actually use it as a hideout. So as a result of that, Kanyalia was preserved. Uh, similarly, in Sri Lanka, you could say that uh, the effect of environment has been positive, or war on the environment has been positive to, uh, to an extent because uh, land was not used, uh, was not cleared for development purposes, for agriculture was preserved uh, because it suited the entity. So similarly, around the world, when conflict has changed from large armies uh, destroying, having this scorched earth policy, now you have um, unconventional asymmetric conflicts where guerrillas and insurgents, they actually use uh, forested areas and the environment for their advantage. So war is not always bad for the world? War is not always bad, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, finally, before we, before we wrap up, uh, one issue that I really want to explore is where do we then find the right balance because surely in a war you you need to pursue strategies that get you some sort of tactical advantage but at the same time we also have a responsibility to protect the environment so in your in your assessment where do you think this balance can be found um, in terms of conflict yes in, in, in conflicts where do we say okay well, this is not enough but this is all right here's the thing and you have uh, there are actual um, international agreements in relation to warfare, in relation to how land is used, how the environment is exploited, that actually prohibits uh, the exploitation. But in war, it's ignored. I just want to give uh, a few more examples of direct uh, impacts. The Gulf War, for example, 600, the, the retreating Iraqi forces from Kuwait, uh, they destroyed 630 oil wells. 
releasing around 500,000 metric tons of pollutants into the air per day. Um, similarly, during the Iran-Iraq conflict, 1,500 kilometers of border between them. That was they have changed it so much that the topography has is unrecognizable today from what it used to be, and that has been um, uh, protected uh, wetland areas for various different types of species. Uh, one more thing is uh, you mentioned earlier about it being a good thing, uh, what be a good thing. Uh, there is the other side as well. I mentioned Sri Lanka an example, but in Colombia there's been an actually actually extensive study done where they so that uh, as a result of the conflict in Colombia, large swaths of jungle were cleared for illegal crops mm. um, and agriculture and mining. So there are both sides and I, I want to say that it's context specific. Mm. So I don't know whether we can find a balance, it's going to be context specific. A really good example from uh, Sri Lanka actually is fisheries. So in the uh, Sri Lankan uh, Navy controlled areas, Fisheries, as we know, was very carefully controlled for security purposes. The time of day they could go out, the next they could use, and the number of boats that went out. So uh, it was maintained. But then in the LTT control areas, there were no restrictions. So dynamite fishing, all of that took place. Interesting. So, so as you can see, there's a lot of synergy between both environmental studies and security studies. And even though it's something that perhaps hasn't gotten the scholarly attention that it deserves, the role that, or rather the impact that warfare has on the environment, I think we both agree, is a very, very important topic that more people should be interested in. So, uh, let me just thank uh, uh, Praveen for joining us today. I hope this was an, well, it was an interesting conversation for us. I hope it was an interesting experience for you too. It was, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to uh, talk again with anyone who's interested in, in exploring this subject in more detail. Absolutely. So, if you're interested in this, guys, please contact us so that we can put you in touch with Praveen, as always. If you like our videos, please hit the like button and subscribe to your channel. This is Nilan from the BCIS and see you soon.